Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me, and um, good morning. I hope you're doing well. We are having another uh, a snow event here in North Carolina, which is rather unusual for us, uh, especially to have two in a row. And um, so, but uh, the the amount of snow we got was sufficient, uh, especially since it got uh, it it became so cold after the snow. Um, that we decided that the wise and prudent thing would be to have the service online because so many secondary roads are still covered uh, with snow and ice. It isn't just that it snowed four to five inches of snow, um, but that now, like this morning, the temperature was in, in the teens. And so um, that causes a great deal of, of uh, freezing and... Um, it makes the roads treacherous and so it, like I said it, it's a judgment call and those are always those are always tough but any times we have to make a call like that we are going to err on the side of caution and that's what we did here so good morning uh, and we're glad to have uh, so many listening in and watching and we're thankful that we have the kind of technology that we have available to to uh, be able to be online um, <clears throat> Last week, uh, we we were online also, and uh, as many of you have have uh, commented and said something to me this week, that uh, my uh, Amazon Echo decided right in the middle of uh, me reading the scripture uh, to, well, for whatever reason, uh, speak up. And um, I, I don't dare say the name of the product, uh, she whose name shall not be spoken, uh, I have no idea why uh, she started, but she did. I have to say that very rarely in my life uh, have I been heckled uh, during a sermon. And I can't think of, you know, I certainly wasn't expecting it to happen when, when I'm in a room alone. Uh, but there you go. And we will see um, if, if uh, it does it again today. I couldn't remember the name. Uh, that you have to call her in order to to make her stop, and that that was uh, my penny thought that was a very very funny, and and I guess it really was. Be that as it may, we're going to try it again today. Uh, would you join me in prayer as we ask God's blessings on uh, this morning's services? And so let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the blessings of technology. Every gift, every good and perfect gift, comes from you. And so, Lord, I'm thankful for uh, the, that we live in a day in which people all around the world can communicate immediately with one another by the means of social media and the Internet. And, um, uh, Lord, they can be used for good or they can be used for ill. Uh, they're just simply tools. And so, Lord, I pray that you would guide our, our minds and our hands and our thoughts and our actions so that uh, these, these wonderful gifts, these technological gifts that you've given us, that we would use them in ways that would glorify you and forgive us of times whenever we don't. Thank you, Father, for the good people at Kinley Missionary Baptist Church. I thank you, Father, for their willingness to serve you, their love for you, for Christ, uh, for the Word, uh, for your church. I pray, God, that you would bless, <coughs> and I pray, Father, that you would bring us back again quickly and as safely as possible. So, Lord, bless the time that we have to gather around the Word. In Jesus' name, and amen. And amen. Well, um, there are several things that uh, we were going to do, uh, and there are some things that have been moved to different times. We had hoped last week uh, to baptize a young lady who has professed Christ at our church, uh, Harper uh, Starling, and um, then we hoped to do it so again today, and I thought it would be you know, very appropriate if it worked out today because I'm preaching today on the baptism of Jesus. And so, uh, Harper, I just want to tell you uh, that we haven't forgotten, and we, we, <laughs> when the Lord lets us go back to our, uh, our services uh, there at our sanctuary, we're looking forward to you following the Lord in believer's baptism. Uh, what is baptism all about? What's its purpose? Well, I think there's no better way to find out than to read about and study the baptism of Jesus Christ. And that's in Luke chapter 3. So if you have a Bible handy, 
That's what we're going to be looking at today. Luke chapter 3, the third chapter of the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to be looking at just two verses. Typically, I preach over uh, quite an extended passage, but today there's only two verses in Luke's Gospel uh, devoted to the baptism of Jesus. But the other Gospels also give information, and so we're going to look at them too. We've been going through the Gospel of Luke ever since uh, Advent season. We did Luke chapter 1 in the Advent season. Then Christmas, we did Luke chapter 2, in which we looked at uh, the birth of Jesus. And Luke's account is a beautiful account. Then we talked about the childhood ministry of, of uh, or the childhood life of Jesus, uh, particularly his encounter with the scribes uh, and the scholars there in the temple at the age of 12. And we have the amazing account of how his parents lost him for three days. Uh, and he spent those three days schooling uh, those who thought they knew the scriptures. Uh, and so we have that account. Then as we move into chapter 3, uh, the scene shifts now to the ministry of John the Baptist. And we talked about uh, what it meant for John and the Word of God to come to the people uh, of Israel. John was a prophet and uh, the, first, the first prophet to speak uh, to Israel in 400 years. What a time, uh, what an enormous time of silence. Uh, in many ways, John was the last Old Testament prophet and the first New Testament prophet. And so we talked about what it meant for his ministry to begin. Uh, and then we talked about John's baptism because it, last week we talked uh, what it was a baptism of repentance. And we're going to look at that again just a bit uh, today. And so on this day, <clears throat> we're going to talk about the baptism of Jesus himself. And so this is in Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, in verses 21 and 22. And so Luke chapter 3, uh, as it's been telling about John's uh, baptism uh, and how he's been baptizing uh, the different ones, and it says <clears throat> in Luke chapter uh, 3, verse 21 and 22, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Well, let's take a look at the baptism of Jesus and what Luke wants us to get from this passage of Scripture. One thing will come through very clearly in this passage and will come through in the entire Gospel of Luke. And that is that Luke really doesn't want uh, Jesus to be in your life. He's not interested with Jesus being in your life. No, Luke wants something much more basic, uh, some, something much more fundamental. Uh, Dr. Luke wants you to start your life with Jesus. Jesus in the center. Jesus as the foundation. Jesus as the beginning. Not, not simply in your life, a part of your life, peripheral to your life, are significant in your life. No, he wants Jesus in your life, in my life, to be central. And then from there, we build our life around him. And so this is the way that Dr. Luke wants us to understand uh, that this is the proper relationship that we should have with Jesus, uh, Jesus Christ. So he does this in these verses by demonstrating that Jesus is the one who was promised by the Father, and he is the one in whom the Father is well pleased. So let's see Jesus go under the water. It says, now when all the people were baptized, and Jesus also was baptized. Well, that's a bit of a surprise, don't you think? Uh, that uh, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. In fact, I think it's perfectly proper to be surprised that Jesus was baptized because John the Baptist himself was surprised. I mean, why does G John baptize Jesus and not the other way around? And, and that's the question we see in Matthew's 
version of the account, where in Matthew chapter 3, in verses 13 and 14, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? And so John himself is surprised, and so I think, I think that raises the question. Why was Jesus baptized by John? Well, Jesus gives an answer, and I think there are several reasons. And so the very first one is because Jesus uh, needed to be baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness. In fact, that's the answer Jesus gives explicitly. When he asked him, he said, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. And Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now, what does that mean? What's the point there? Well, <clears throat> the point is this. Jesus was baptized by John for the very same reason that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day for the same reason that he was presented on the temple at the proper time, and that the offerings were made for him by his mother. Jesus uh, was baptized for the same reason that he attended the Passover at age 12 in Luke chapter 2. You see, Jesus went about accomplishing uh, the perfect life of righteousness that you and I ought to live, but were not able to because of our fallen condition. In other words, what Jesus does in his life, he doesn't just simply die on the cross for us at the age of 33. No, when he dies at age 33, he is giving a lifetime of obedience and righteousness as an offering and as a sacrifice. The reason why he could die for our sins on the cross is because he had been spending 33 years saving us. Everything that we should be, he was. Everything we should do, he did. He was in two things. He, one, he was our substitute. Everything we should be, he was. And second, he is our example. Everything that we ought to be doing, he shows us what, how, how we should be following in his steps. So, he accomplished a perfect life of righteousness and by being and, and then by being baptized he is identifying himself with the people of god and so we have you know when we're baptized we are announcing that we are uniting with christ by faith when christ was baptized he's announcing that he is willing to enter into union with us and so we have where jesus is doing, he's being baptized to fulfill all righteousness. But second, there's a second reason why he was baptized, and that was to affirm John's ministry. So when Jesus submitted to John's baptism, he was showing his approval of John. And the first thing he was showing his approval is he proved of John's ministry. And he was saying, yes, John is indeed a prophet a one who is presenting them with the word of God. And so when Jesus was baptized, it was his affirmation of John's ministry. It was also an affirmation of John's message. Uh, because <clears throat> what was John's message? His message was that Israel needed to repent. Now, this was quite a shocking message because Israel was convinced that the, whole, the rest of the world uh, needed to repent. Because the rest of the world, as far as they understood, was separated from God. But they considered themselves to be in covenant with God. Uh, that they were the sons of Abraham. And so therefore, their spiritual condition was good to go. And they assumed that they were right with God. Big mistake. John was telling them not so. And in fact, that was what was so radical about John's baptism. Is that, like I said last week, that... Uh, the Jews would baptize proselytes, those who would convert over to Judaism. The first thing they did to show that they were converting over to Judaism was to be baptized. Well, <clears throat> John wasn't baptizing just Gentiles. He was baptizing Jews also, demonstrating to them that they also needed to be right with God. Uh, it, just because someone is in church 
just because someone is a church member doesn't mean, first off, that they're saved. And secondly, doesn't mean automatically that they're right with God. I remember reading a pastor recently talking about how anytime he's dealing with uh, a, a Christian in a counseling session or a family or whatever the circumstances may be, the very first question he asks them is, tell me about your devotional life. And they may say, well, we're here because of marital problems. Or we're here because of, of, of this problem. He said, yeah, but first tell me about your walk with God. Because that is first and foremost. That's so many times that is the root of the problem. Uh, so many of the things that we, we perceive as troubles are actually the fruit of where the real problem is and that it's fundamentally spiritual. And so John, his ministry and his message Jesus was showing his stamp of approval whenever he was baptized. So uh, the first reason why Jesus was baptized was to fulfill all righteousness. The second reason was uh, to affirm John's ministry. The third reason Jesus was baptized was to begin his ministry. I mean, so far, he's performed no ministry. Uh, if you'll, you read John, Mark's gospel, it starts with the baptism of Jesus. Or you have uh, the other gospel accounts, and, and including uh, uh, here in Luke. You don't have Jesus doing ministry, per se, while he is a child. So his baptism sets in motion everything that happens next. And what is it that happens next? Well, what happens next is a life of sacrifice. In fact, later on uh, in, the, in Jesus's ministry, um, James and John will come up to Jesus with a very big request. And after they make the request, Jesus will say to them in Mark 10 and verse 38, uh, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And are you able to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And what does he mean by talking about the baptism I am baptized with? It is the sacrifice, the giving of his life. And <clears throat> that's what you need to understand that, that baptism is doing here. It is signifying the beginning of Jesus's life of ministry. And it is one of the sacrificial giving of himself. And so <clears throat> Jesus does this to fulfill all righteousness, to put his stamp of approval on John, uh, to begin his ministry. And then Jesus is baptized to set the pattern. You see, a good leader never asks his followers to do something that he's not willing to do himself. And so Jesus, um, as I said, he asked James and John whenever he said, are you willing to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Truth of the matter is, he asked that of each and every one of us. He asked it of each and every one of us every day. Are we willing to follow Jesus in the kind of sacrifice that cost everything? Are you willing to follow Jesus in that way? Nathan Finn is a dear friend of mine. We were, uh, he taught here at uh, Southeastern where I teach for many years now. He is uh, uh, the provost down at North Greenville College. But about 10 years ago, he took a group of Southeastern students to Southeast Asia to a, a, an overwhelmingly uh, Islamic country. And we won't say which country it was, but uh, there they, they worked with the missionaries and the local believers that were there. And they were experiencing great persecution, a very hostile environment. And they'd heard about a village that, um, where there were some at least one believer uh, there that had ex suffered a terrible persecution. Uh, they, they, they had, um, the, the village had basically disowned him because he had become a Christian. But they'd heard that there were some others who, despite that young fellow's persecution, maybe perhaps because of it, um, they, there were some who were inquiring and wanting to know more. So the missionary, uh, Dr. Finn, and some of the students went there uh, and it didn't go well in the village. In fact, the imam uh, who, uh, who, who run the mosque in that city, stir, or that little village, stirred up such controversy that they were forced to leave the village. But 
those who had expressed interest made it clear that they wanted to talk more. And so they set up a time to meet outside the village. Uh, and so they, they, they set up a time and they set up the place. And the place that they met was underneath a bridge uh, by a river that was close to the village. And when they met there, there was a, a group of men from the village who met them there at the appointed time. And so uh, they preached to them, told them about Jesus, explained the gospel. Um, and there were six of that. There was a larger group of men, but six of the men in that group uh, professed faith in Christ, saying that they wanted to become Christians and that they wanted to follow the Lord in believer's baptism in the river right there. Um, this was an extraordinary thing. Uh, and the other men of the village begged them not to do it. They warned them of the consequences and said you know, to them, this will not go well. Whatever you do, don't be baptized. And yet those six men said, no, we are Christians. We are trusting Christ and we are going to profess Christ by following him in baptism. And so they went out into the water, each one of them. And so they were asked the questions that are typically asked uh, of a new Christian. Are you trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are, do you believe he is the Son of God? But they were also asked, are you prepared to lose your livelihood, to lose your family, and maybe even lose your life? And each one of those six men gave a three-word answer. Jesus is Lord. And when they said Jesus is Lord, and upon that profession of faith, they were then baptized. Let's remember that that's what baptism really says. Every baptism is first a funeral, buried with him in baptism. When we are baptized, we are saying goodbye to the old life. The old life has died. Say goodbye. And there's a funeral. Then there's a, res there's, there's a resurrection. Raised to walk in newness of life. We need to understand <clears throat> that that is what baptism means, not just in Southeast Asia where you're in Islamic context and where you might lose everything, but it also means that here in the United States. For each and every one of us that follows the Lord in believer's baptism, we are saying yes to the, the, to the example and the model that Jesus sets forth for us. His baptism was a baptism of sacrifice, of giving of everything to live a new life in the kingdom of God. That's what our baptism means. We also are saying goodbye to the old life, trusting Jesus, buried with him in baptism, and then raised to walk in newness of life. And so we see where Jesus first goes under the water. Then the second thing I want you to see in this passage is how Jesus seeks the Father. Notice what it says again in verse 21. It says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying. <clears throat> I just invite you to go through the Gospel of Luke and notice how many times Jesus emphasizes the prayer life, or excuse me, that Luke emphasizes the prayer life of Jesus. In Luke chapter 6, in verse 12, it says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. Then again in chapter 11, and verse 1, Luke records, Now it came to pass, as he was praying in a certain place, when he had ceased, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. There's obviously something so remarkable, so unique and different about the prayer life of Jesus that the disciples say, we, we need to know how to do this. Our Luke chapter 22 and verse 32, he says to Simon Peter, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. 
And so Dr. Luke emphasizes the prayer life of Jesus. Now, why would he do that? Well, <clears throat> what Luke is letting us know is how Jesus lived a perfect life in his humanity. Now, in one sense, Jesus' miracles really are not that surprising. I mean, he is God, after all. He's the second person of the Trinity, uh, taken on human flesh. So when, when we read about him walking on the water or turning water into wine or healing the blind, the sick, and the deaf, well, okay. I mean, he's the Son of God. This is this. It, but, but what Luke wants us to know <clears throat> and what is emphasized not only by Luke, but especially by Luke, and that is this. Um, <clears throat> it isn't just that Jesus performed miracles. It's that Jesus lived a sinless life as a man. Now you think about it. Living a sinless life. Now that's another matter. Because he's doing this in his humanity. He's not cheating. He's not, um, he's not Clark Kent. And you know, Superman actually just hiding behind <clears throat> the mild-mannered report, a reporter's persona. Uh, just pretending... Uh, to be tempted, just pretending uh, to struggle. No, no, Jesus was genuinely, truly human. He experienced, in fact, we're going to see in the next week, whenever we look at the temptation of Jesus, Jesus experienced every temptation that is common to you and me. And how does he do so? Does he cheat by, you know, saying, well, I'll, I'll depend upon my, hum my, my deity? No. No, what we find is, is that <clears throat> he lives a life, he, he, Jesus of Nazareth, lives a life of complete dependence upon God. You know, remember what Jesus says in John 15, 5, without me, you can do nothing. Well, that was true of his relationship with the father. In fact, what you find is, is that he doesn't do things in his own power as the second person of the triune Godhead. No, the Bible makes it explicitly clear that what he does, he does so by the power of the Holy Spirit. He lives a life, a perfect life of obedience in his humanity, in, of complete dependence upon the Father, and he does so because he's filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the point that it says here. Look again at verse 21. It says, and as he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him. Jesus is operating in the power of the Spirit. And it is as a genuine, true man, guided and filled with the Holy Spirit, that he is living a life in a dark, dangerous world that you and I know all about. And he does so in perfect obedience. And so we have where Jesus seeks out the Father in prayer. And you begin to understand why he felt it so necessary to be a man of prayer. Now, if Jesus found it necessary to pray, what does it say about you and me? And so we see first where Jesus goes under the water. And then second, we see where Jesus seeks the Father. And then third, I want you to see the divine declaration of verse 22. Now, <clears throat> the Trinity uh, is a biblical truth. That is that we worship one God, but this one God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the Trinity is implied in the Old Testament. And if you want to hear more about that, I did. I talked about that uh, as I preach through the series on uh, the book of Exodus. And we have those in our Facebook page if you want to uh, listen to some of those. So it, the Trinity is implied uh, in the Old Testament, but it is explicitly affirmed in the New Testament that God is, God is three persons. Now, <clears throat> it's taught... Over and over and over again. I mean, think of the baptismal formula. Whenever uh, we baptize, Lord willing, we baptize Harper next week. Uh, you know, it's a, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son 
and of the Holy Spirit, because that's what we're taught in the baptismal formula. Um, so, so, so that's there. It's taught all kinds of places, but I can only think of one time in all of the scripture in which all three persons of the Trinity manifest themselves at the same time. And it's right here at the baptism of Jesus. Here at the baptism of Jesus, all three persons of the Trinity make themselves um, uh, known and evident. Notice the heavens opens um, upon, the, upon the sun. Uh, we have where the dove descends. This is the Holy Spirit. And then the Father speaks. And so we have all three persons of the Trinity manifest. Jesus in the water, the Holy Spirit descending, and then the Father speaking out loud. So this is an extraordinary event. This is an extraordinary thing. And so <clears throat> as the Father speaks, what does he say? Well, first he says, this is my beloved Son. What is he saying here? He's saying that Jesus is the king of Israel. And if you know anything about the Davidic covenant, the promise David had that there would come a descendant of David and that this descendant would be the Messiah. And it says of him in 2 Samuel 7 and verse 14, where the Davidic covenant, the covenant is made with David. I will be his father and he shall be my son. And that's what we have expressed here. My beloved son, this is the king of Israel. In you, I am well pleased. Not only is Jesus the king of Israel, he is God's servant. And this again fulfills the promises that we were given in the Old Testament by the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 42 promises that there is a coming Messiah. What will he be like? Well, Isaiah 42, verses 1 and 2. Behold my servant, whom I uphold my chosen, in whom my soul delights, is well pleased. I have put my spirit upon him. There you have the promise of the Holy Spirit. He will bring forth justice to the nations. So there you have the promises, the Old Testament promises, that are being uh, referenced in by the Father speaking in the way that he does. And so <clears throat> we have the divine declaration. And this is, like I said, the one place where the Trinity makes uh, itself known, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so as Jesus is presented, it's presented as my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased, and that he is the Son of God. And so here Luke does something really kind of surprising. And you see this in verse 23. It says, Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, as was supposed, of course, he's virgin born, but supposed of Joseph. And then we have the genealogy for the rest of chapter 3 of, of, of Jesus. Now, there's another genealogy, of course, and that's Matthew's gospel. And it's interesting, uh, the differences. Um, Luke unlike Matthew, uh, waits until here to give the, the genealogy. Now, with when Matthew's genealogy, he went from father to son. And, and you know, it said so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so -and begat so-and-so. That's not what Luke does. Luke starts with the son and goes backwards to the father. And so where Matthew's genealogy goes forward, Luke's genealogy goes backwards. Um, in Matthew's genealogy, he starts with Abraham and comes all the way up through Mary to Jesus. Luke goes opposite, going from Joseph all the way backwards, not to Abraham, all the way back to Adam. And, and then whenever he makes reference to Adam, he calls Adam the son of God. And so he lets us know that Jesus is the new Adam the last Adam, the Son of God. And so we have Jesus being baptized, and by so doing, we see him uh, showing his dependence upon the Father. 
And then we have the father's declaration that this is his son in whom he is well pleased. This is what baptism teaches us. It's a magnificent truth. I'm an American. Like the song says, I'm, I'm proud to be an American. Glad to have an American flag. Uh, sometimes we have a flag uh, during warm weather out on the, you know, on on our house, uh, and and glad to identify as a citizen of the United States. I mean, what would we think of? In fact, I can tell you what I think of some of an American who who who's not not proud to be an American. If you're ashamed to be an American, I'm thinking, what are you doing here? You know, I'm, I'm glad to be an American. Well, if that's true about my American citizenship, it should be exponentially greater about my identity in the kingdom of God. And that's what baptism does. It identifies you and me with Jesus Christ and that we are citizens of his kingdom. So <clears throat> Jesus asked us, are you able to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? That's the challenge. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for it, how it teaches us about Jesus. And because your word teaches us about Jesus, your, your word, these are the words of life. Because he is our life. He is, he is our example. He is our substitute. He is our joy. He is our wisdom. He is our sanctification. He is our justification. I pray now, God, for the grace to follow Jesus. First, to trust him. To simply bow the knee and acknowledge our sinfulness. And I pray that if there's anyone listening that has not trusted Jesus Christ and, and the, the atonement that he made on Calvary's tree, I pray that right now would be a time that they too would bow the head, head and, and pray and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want the forgiveness you provide. I want to be born into your kingdom. And Lord, I know that if they would pray that way, you said whoever would come to you, you would never cast out. And so, Lord, I pray that this would be so. And then, Lord, for those of us who have named the name of Christ, God, give us the grace to follow you. Lord, we are weak. You're strong. And without you, we can do nothing. And so we pray for a great grace upon all of us as we see the challenge presented to us by Jesus in his example. So, Lord, I pray, Father, for all that have listened. I pray, Father, that you would give a blessing upon them, keep them safe during this weather. Pray, Father, that you would allow us to return back uh, once again to uh, uh, being able to worship together at Kinley very soon. Thank you, Father, for your many blessings, and we'll thank you for this. In Jesus' name, and amen, and amen. Well, it's been great to be able to talk to you, uh, even if it is uh, just uh, electronically. But I hope God is uh, blessing you today. Stay safe, and we look forward to seeing you again very soon. God bless you.